So far on this channel, all my videos have pretty much revolved around things that I am familiar with and things that I probably would have used back in the day, which usually meant PCs from the early 90s and up. But for this video, I thought I would do something a little bit different and get out of my comfort zone a bit. So that's why I've decided to change things up a bit and take a look at this IBM 5155 Luggable from around 1984. Now this is a PC that I recently picked up as part of a big batch of retro computer goodies and I'm pretty excited to test it out as I've never actually used, let alone owned, anything quite like this before. Okay, so this is not actually that far out of my comfort zone because it still is basically just a PC, albeit a pretty early one and in a very different form factor than what I'm used to. But the basics are pretty much the same as we'll see in a bit. So this video ended up being a bit longer than I would have liked, so I've included timestamps in the description below which will allow you to skip past any parts that you might not be that interested in. If nothing else though, I highly recommend that you watch the part towards the end of the video where I play around with CGA composite video and a dual monitor setup, because I think that's probably one of the most interesting things about this little IBM 5155. But enough about all that, let's get into the video. So what exactly is this thing? Well, at its core, the IBM 5155 is basically just an IBM 5160, otherwise known as the XT from 1983, with a built-in 9-inch monitor, two 5 and a quarter inch drive base for either floppy drives or hard drives, and a detachable keyboard, which forms the base of the unit. Finally, the case has been modified to include this handle, meaning it can be picked up and moved around as easily as a large suitcase. However, this is not some type of early laptop either. Firstly, it's far too big and heavy to even think of using on your lap. Ooh, my man veg. Oh. And secondly, there is no battery of any kind built into the machine, so it still requires power from the wall socket in order to work. For this reason, plus the fact that these computers are pretty heavy, they earned the title Luggable Computers, which is a good name for them, I think. Unless you are built like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you will definitely be lugging these things around. They're pretty heavy and pretty awkward. But if you were a businessman who had to travel a lot on buses or aircraft back in the day, these suitcase-sized computers would have been very valuable, I imagine. It certainly beats trying to carry a full-size IBM 5150 around wherever you go, that's for sure. Anyway, the 5155 is not the first portable computer. It's not even IBM's first portable computer. That honor technically goes to the IBM 1401 Datamobile from 1960, which consisted of an IBM 1401 mainframe computer in the back of a truck. But that doesn't really count, unless IBM hoped having board meetings in a parking lot out of the back of a trailer would become a thing. No, this was obviously meant more as a marketing stunt than a practical proposition. IBM's first real portable computer would probably be the 5100 from 1973. Although with prices starting from $11,000 and going all the way up to $20,000, it could hardly be classified as a personal computer. The first machine which could realistically be called a portable personal computer was the Osborne One from 1981, which at less than $1,800 new, including a free business software bundle worth over $1,500, was certainly a no-brainer for many business folk, and consequently it sold like hotcakes. Right up until Osborne started prematurely announcing their next product and telling everyone about how much better than their current product it would be, meaning that people decided to forego buying their current product and just wait for the next one, something referred to as the Osborne effect ever since. This resulted in Osborne going out of business a few years later. <laughs> But now we come to the main reason behind the IBM 5155's existence. And it's this, the Compact Portable from 1983. Like the Osborne, the Compact was a luggable computer with built-in monitor, space for two floppy or hard drives and a detachable keyboard. But unlike the myriad other computer manufacturers at the time who were designing their own hardware and software and then trying to outcompete each other, Compaq designed their new computer to be 100% compatible with IBM's wildly successful personal computer, the 5150, which was dominating the marketplace at this point. The IBM 
personal computer coming to selected stores across the country. This combination of portability and compatibility was a very good one indeed and the Compact Portable sold like hotcakes with sales amounting to 53,000 units in the first year alone. This obviously made IBM very nervous to say the least and they decided that they had to do something quickly to compete with this new interloper. The 5155 was the machine they came up with to do that. So naturally then, the first thing you notice about this machine is that it is very similar in design to the Compact Portable. It has the same size monitor, although it's amber in the IBM's case, whereas the Compact was green. It has two drive bays in a similar location to the Compact, and even the keyboard is very similar with this coiled telephone style wire connecting it to the computer. And originally I thought that maybe this was IBM trying to copy the design of the Compact. But actually I don't really think that that is the case. Most of these early portable computers actually had a very similar design. Machines like the K-Pro2, the Hyperion by Dynalogic and the Eagle Sprint personal computer all had a very similar design. So it seems IBM were just basically playing it safe and going for the same basic design as everyone else. This would also allow IBM to get the design done very quickly. And that's kind of a theme you get with this machine, that it was designed in a very short space of time. That's not to say that it's badly built by any means. In fact, like pretty much all IBMs from the 1980s, the 5155 is built like a tank. The materials are of very good quality, it's incredibly well put together, and the keyboard that comes with this machine is pretty much worth the price of admission alone. I could make a whole video about just how brilliant this keyboard is, but simply put, it's basically a slightly modified and significantly lighter version of IBM's mechanical Model F keyboard, widely regarded as one of the best keyboards ever made. With its fantastically clicky capacitive buckling spring switches, and wonderfully tactile textured keycaps, it really is an absolute joy to type on this keyboard, even if the layout does take a bit of getting used to. But yes, as you can see there is certainly nothing wrong with the build quality of the 5155. But nonetheless, once you get inside the machine, you definitely start to get the impression that the 5155 was maybe slightly rushed to market. Let me show you exactly what I mean. So these days, the motherboard you get in your average laptop is vastly different from the one you get in a desktop PC. It's highly integrated and specifically designed for only that one system. But in these early portable computers, that wasn't the norm. And in the case of the 5155, IBM decided to just use the exact same motherboard as their latest desktop PC, the 5160. And it's much the same story with the rest of the hardware. The hard drive and its controller card are all standard MFM parts from the desktop parts bin, as is the floppy drive and its controller card. Even the graphics card, which you may expect to be different since this machine has a built-in monitor, isn't. IBM just used the standard CGA card they had laying around for the desktop PCs and connected the monitor to a little built-in header on the card instead. Now of course there was nothing really wrong with this, these parts were a known quantity and had been proven to work reliably in the desktop system at this point, but it does still give me the impression that IBM were in a hurry to get this machine out as soon as possible. But anyway, at this point you may very well be wondering why I haven't yet showed anything from the inside of this particular IBM 5155. And the reason for that is, well my 5155 as it turns out is not exactly standard. In fact it turns out that there have been some rather interesting little modifications made to this computer. So let's jump in and have a look. Looking inside the case, we have... Wait, hold on. Where did everything go? Oh yes, that's right. Uh, unfortunately, when I tried to pile this machine on for the first time, it just made a clicking noise and wouldn't post. So I decided to strip out most of the components, hook it up to a spare AT power supply, and get it set up on the desk here. So now we can take a closer look at what we actually have. So if you are at all familiar with the 5155, you might have already spotted something a bit weird here. IBM motherboards at this time were supposed to be golden brown in color, whereas this one, well, isn't. So that's the first little surprise that this machine is hiding. 
it has been upgraded to a Turbo XT using this aftermarket motherboard. And according to the writing here, this can go all the way up to 10 megahertz, which is more than double the 4.77 megahertz of the standard machine. So that's actually pretty cool. I suppose it's a bit of a pity that the original board is gone, but this turbo board is probably better for any games or applications that I might actually conceivably use on this computer, so I think it's probably a good thing. Another interesting surprise is the hard drive controller card that came with this machine. I really don't know much about these old MFM drives, so it took me a while to figure this out, but it turns out that this card is not actually an MFM card at all, it's an RLL card. So RLL was a very similar format to MFM and even used the same cable arrangement but the data format was different, allowing data to be stored more tightly on the disk, effectively increasing the capacity and speed by up to 50%. So ordinarily an RLL card would be attached to an RLL hard disk as you may imagine, but in this case there was another odd little surprise here. This machine has a Seagate ST225 drive which is a 20 megabyte MFM drive. Now the closest RLL drive to this is a ST138R which is actually a 33 megabyte drive. And that is indeed what the controller card identifies this MFM hard drive as. So it appears that this 20 megabyte MFM drive was effectively over formatted to more than 30 megabyte using the RLL standard. I really wasn't too keen on this idea, so I initially wanted to try and set this machine back to standard using an MFM controller card rather, but that really didn't go according to plan, as we'll see a bit later in the video. Another odd modification is the plug for the video signal going to the inbuilt monitor, which has been changed from the default internal plug to an RCA style connector that plugs into the composite plug on the back of the graphics card. I have no idea why this might have actually been done, except maybe to allow other video sources to be plugged into the internal monitor, which is a fun idea and a nice way to test the monitor actually, so we'll play around with that a bit later. And finally, it seems that the original floppy drive was also replaced at some point with this aftermarket beige one, which possibly indicates that the original one wore out or something. I did try to find out more about this machine's history, but unfortunately I couldn't find anything. But all these modifications, as well as the general condition of the case, seems to suggest that this was a very well used IBM 5155. It seems that the previous owner decided that they needed as much performance and storage space as possible, as well as possibly needing to connect other devices to the inboard monitor. It's all just a bit strange, but I think it's a pretty interesting machine, and it's a pity that I couldn't learn more about its history. But anyway, enough about all that, let's see if this machine actually worked. As I mentioned, I suspected that the power supply was dead, so now that I've got the board hooked up to a spare power supply, I reinstalled all of the different expansion cards and hooked it up to the Sony LCD monitor that I got a while back. This monitor is really great for testing all kinds of vintage computer things because it has a whole bunch of different input. And because the CGA card in the IBM has a composite output, it's a simple matter of just connecting the monitor to the card using an RCA cable. So it's time to power it on and hope for the best. And there we are, the board posts perfectly fine. We can see it's an XT board from 1986 and that it has the full 640k of RAM, which I think is the maximum you can get on an XT anyway. And here we see that the hard drive controller card recognizes the hard drive, although it thinks that it's a RLL drive when it's actually an MFM, but whatever, it's working. Although it turns out that that beige floppy drive that came with the computer wasn't working, so once I'd found another one, I managed to get it booted up into DOS no problem. And running FDisk confirmed that the hard drive was indeed being seen by the system, although it wasn't accessible, so it probably needed to be formatted. As I mentioned earlier, I wasn't too keen on over formatting this drive to 32 megabytes because it was originally a 20 megabyte drive, so at this point I decided to try and get this hard drive working with an MFM card because I would have to reformat it anyway. And this actually turned into a bit of a nightmare. Although I had a couple of spare 8-bit MFM hard drive cards lying around, uh, four of them to be exact, none of them would work with this hard drive. I would either get a 1701 error on post, meaning that there's a problem with the card or that the card doesn't recognize the existing hard drive format, or the computer would do nothing and there'd be no indication that a hard drive of any kind had been detected. 
So these early MFM drives are a bit weird in that they require a low level format to be performed whenever you change hard drive controller card. This effectively links the hard drive and its card together. And if you want to move this hard drive into another XT machine with a different controller card, you have to do another low level format on it. And it gets even more fun. These low level formats have to be performed with a program called debug. And the parameters required to perform this low level format vary depending on the hard drive controller card's manufacturer and which memory address it currently occupies. Anyway, I tried all of the different parameters that I could find for the different card manufacturers and different memory addresses, but I just couldn't get it to work with anything. All that would happen basically was that I'd get these weird corrupted characters all over the screen. I even tried with a few spare hard drives that I had lying around and different cables and no combination of any drive or cable or controller card would result in anything different. So I really have no idea what was going on here. And after two days of struggling, I decided to bravely quit and just stick to the original RLL card. And yeah, this one basically just worked. The debug command loaded perfectly fine and I was able to initialize and format the hard drive no problem. You can see here that it wants to format it to 32.6 megabytes, which is pretty big for a hard drive that was originally 20 megabytes, but uh, it didn't seem to have any issues formatting the drive to this size, but I did notice later when it was verifying that some of the cylinders took a while to verify. And the hard drive did make a bit of an odd noise while this was happening. But there were no errors or warnings and the hard drive initialization completed successfully. And I was able to partition and then format the hard drive with no problem. I'll have to keep an eye on it and see if I develop any issues later but for now it seems that the hard drive is fixed. So the next thing that I wanted to have a look at was that power supply. I removed it from the case. opened it up and then I suddenly remembered that I know absolutely nothing about power supplies and that if I touch anything in here I'll probably just end up electrocuting myself. So I closed it up again and sent it off to my tame electronic genius friend Murray and three days later it was back fully repaired. Thanks Murray. So now that I had a working power supply, I could test the monitor, which I wasn't even sure was working or not at this point. So I plugged it back in, hooked up a hard drive for extra load on the power supply, and flipped the switch. And other than that very brief brown underwear moment, which was nothing more than a power cable fouling the fan, everything started working just as it should. I needed to turn up the brightness here to get a signal on the monitor, but once I did, it came to life quite nicely. That weird pattern you're seeing is just what the monitor does when it doesn't have an input signal. So let's see what we can do about that. So you might remember that this monitor has been modified with this RCA cable on the end of it. So that got me thinking. What do I have with a composite output that I can use to test this monitor? And well, the only thing that I had on hand was this uh, Famiclone Nintendo system. I had been using this to play around on my Sony LCD monitor. But I thought it would be pretty hilarious to see how Nintendo looks through a tiny 9 inch monochrome IBM monitor. So I simply plugged the monitor into the back of the Nintendo, hooked up the audio which was still plugged into the Sony LCD monitor, and powered them both up. And Bob's your uncle. It turns out that this little monitor was actually working quite well. I bet you've never seen anybody play Star Force on an IBM 5155 before. Or how about Battle City? So now that the hardware was sorted out, it was time to take care of the cosmetics. 
It might not look too bad on camera, but this machine was actually very dirty. So I decided to strip it down and clean up the case. I started by removing the screws that hold the monitor and the rest of the case onto the front panel. And I noticed here that the plastic front panel was actually broken where the screw screws in, so I'm going to have to fix this later. I then had to unclip and remove this RJ45 style keyboard plug. So now finally the front panel is free and we can have a look at just how dirty it is and why I had to remove it. When you look closely here you can see that it actually is really dirty. There's what looks like sand or mud here as well as uh, spider webs and what be mold even. And when I turned it upside down and tried to knock out as much of the crud as I could, I even found quite a few dead insects stuck in this gap in the front panel. And here's another one. This case is pretty gross. I mean, just have a look at all the stuff that was left after working on only the front panel. So to clean up the outside of this case, I thought I would use this. It's bicarbonate of soda. I saw this in a video by the 8-bit guy. Um, he used it on his compact portable, I believe. So I thought I would give it a go because it seemed to work really well. So I just sprinkled the bicarb onto the case and then I sprayed it down with a spray bottle filled with water and then set to work scrubbing the case with the bicarb. I also did the front panel in the same way. Although I had to use a paintbrush in this case to get into some of these hard to reach places. After I had cleaned everything as best as I could by hand, I threw everything into the dishwasher just to finish it off. Now granted this might actually seem a bit odd, but the dishwasher is actually fantastic for this. It's brilliant at cleaning, well anything really, including dishes. But you do have to be careful when cleaning plastics like I am here. You really don't want the temperature any higher than about 50 degrees centigrade, otherwise things might warp or melt. But here they are after two hours when the dishwasher was finally done. Ah, dishwasher fresh. Not only are they cleaner than you'll ever get them by hand, but they smell amazing too. So the only thing the dishwasher couldn't get rid of was this mold, which was actually embedded into the finish on the inside of the front panel. So I'm going to be using isopropyl alcohol to get rid of this. So I just pour a little bit into this cap here, and then I'm going to scrub it down using an old toothbrush. One final little job that I needed to do before I could start putting the system back together was to fix that broken stud on the front of the case. I started by sticking the broken piece of plastic back onto the case using some super glue. I then decided to use a product that we have over here called Prattly Putty. This is an epoxy putty that becomes rock hard and incredibly strong once set and should be more than strong enough to support whatever load that little plastic stud needs to endure. And after installing the putty around the base of the stud I was fairly confident that this wouldn't be breaking again anytime soon. So with almost everything else removed we're now left with a pretty much bare chassis and a monitor. At this point I was thinking about even removing the monitor from the chassis so that I could put the bare steel chassis back into the dishwasher and give it a good clean. But I decided not to do that, mostly because of these stickers which are on the side of the case. The dishwasher would almost certainly destroy these and they're an important part of the history of this computer. So I decided instead to just clean up the chassis as best I can by hand using a mixture of white spirit vinegar and water.
So it turns out I forgot about something rather important. The keyboard. I don't even know if it's actually working, so let's give it a quick test. And obviously, because this keyboard uses that weird little RJ45 plug, I had to first plug it into the extension cord, which I had extracted from the IBM's case earlier, and hooked it up. And sure enough, it pretty much worked right away. Gotta love IBM quality from the 1980s. But this keyboard is also incredibly dirty, so let's get it taken apart and cleaned up. And now it's time once again for baking soda and elbow grease. There was also what looked like marker pen on the back of this keyboard, so I just used some isopropyl alcohol to get rid of this. Next, I had to remove and clean all of these keycaps. These were actually really easy to take off, so that was a really nice surprise. I've had keyboards in the past where removing keys has been a real pain in the backside, so this was a nice one to work on actually. And then it was just a case of scrubbing each keycap using some dishwashing liquid and water, which obviously took quite a while. And then rinse them off and left them to dry. I won't bore you with the reassembly. As you may imagine, it's pretty much the reverse of the disassembly. So here's the freshly restored keyboard looking shiny and pretty much new. The one thing I wasn't able to replace were these little feet on the bottom of the keyboard. And I didn't have any material that was even remotely similar to this that I could try and make replacements out of. So I'll just have to see if I can come up with something for these in the future. And with that, I think it's reassembly time. I feel a montage coming on. And there we are, all reassembled, cleaned and looking as good as the day it was new back in 1984. And now that the restoration is done, I wanted to check it, the computer that is using this program called Check It. And luckily everything checked out fine. And this also confirmed that we do indeed have a Turbo XT which is running at the full 10 megahertz. What a beast. So what can we do with all the CPU power? Well, we can play games obviously. It's a silly question. And perhaps unsurprisingly this little machine is actually really good at running XT and even early 80 class games. And everything from simple puzzle games like Sokoban here to more advanced stuff like Test Drive and Grand Prix Circuit all running really nicely on that cute little 9 inch amber monitor with those amazing PC speaker sound effects in the background. even if the noise that this PC makes does almost drown them out. And even more demanding stuff like Top Gun and Planet X3 
still ran perfectly fine on this computer. Whereas I think a normal XT would probably have struggled with a couple of these games. But what happens if you aren't a fan of the tiny little inbuilt monitor, as cute and charming as it may be? Well that's where this computer actually gets really interesting. You may remember that this computer has a CGA card in it, and that the monitor plugs into this card using a little RCA plug at the back. And so there's nothing stopping us from just unplugging the inbuilt monitor and plugging in an external monitor, like the Sony LCD from earlier, which is actually a really nice monitor because it has NTSC capability, which is really rare here in South Africa. And this then unlocks an alternative CGA mode, namely CGA Composite. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about how this mode works, I don't really even understand it 100% myself. But if you'd like to learn more about this, there's a great video by the 8-bit guy on CGA and I'll put a link to that video in the description below. But basically what it comes down to is that you can get something that resembles 16 color EGA mode out of a CGA card which was usually restricted to only 4 colors. And the difference that this made to some games was quite astounding actually. Space Quest 2 is probably one of the best examples of this. Here's what the game would look like in standard CGA 4 color mode, which I can't show because I don't actually have a RGB CGA monitor. And now here it is in composite. As you can see it's night and day basically between composite and normal CGA. It's not quite as good as EGA but it looks so so much better than just standard 4 color CGA. It's amazing. Another game where the transformation is pretty amazing is Tapper. This is a really cute little game where you play a barman who has to keep up with the drinks orders of a bunch of patrons in a bar. And here it is running on the monochrome inbuilt monitor. And now in CGA. And then in CGA Composite. Once again the CGA Composite is worlds ahead of any other mode. It's so good it could almost pass for VGA I think. It's an amazing transformation. Another great game for showcasing this is Planet X3 from the 8-bit guy. This game supports a variety of modes including CGA Composite. So here's the game running on the inbuilt monitor in normal CGA mode. And once again in CGA Composite, which I'm sure you'll agree is miles better. Another game that really shows off the CGA Composite mode very well is Wasteland from 1988. This is pretty much the spiritual successor to the Fallout series of games. And you can see it running in standard CGA 4 color mode in the background. But now watch what happens when we go to Composite. It's just so much better. We actually have proper colors now. So yeah, that's pretty much CGA composite mode. I think it's really awesome how programmers were able to turn what is essentially a flaw with NTSC artifacting into this asset that allowed them to create all these extra colors. It's just really, really clever. One final little interesting thing that I wanted to show before I start wrapping this video up and which is kind of video mode related, is that this machine can actually support two monitors at the same time, with each monitor running on a separate graphics card. And so, by installing one of these MDA clone cards into the PC, I'm able to connect this IBM 5151 monochrome monitor. And while there were a few software packages that allowed you to use both monitors at the same time, like Lotus 123 for example, in most cases you would have to switch between the monochrome and the CGA using the mode command that came with MS-DOS. So once again I'm not going to go into too much detail about this. There's a great video by Retrospector78 on YouTube um, where he goes through all the cool things you can do with the dual monitor setup. So if you're interested in that be sure to check out his video. Uh, there's a link in the description below. But the main reason I wanted to show you this is that these MDA clone cards support a Hercules mode which is also supported by two of our games here, namely Space Quest 2 and Planet X3. So here's Space Quest 2 running on the 5151 monitor. 
It's quite funny how slow the phosphorus or whatever is on these monitors. It's almost as if you're playing these games on a mainframe from the 1970s when you play it on this monitor. But even though the graphics take some getting used to in this Hercules mode, it is incredibly good at displaying text, which looks very sharp and very crisp compared to CGA. Planet X3 also has this mode, and to my eye, it looks even better than Space Quest. The text still looks remarkably good, but the graphics don't seem to have been compromised at all. It looks almost as good as CGA on a monochrome monitor, so I don't quite know how they've managed this, but it's an impressive feat. And here's the finished machine, all set up with its extra monitor and a bunch of random 80s things that I found lying around. And I must say that I really enjoyed working on this computer, even though there were some parts that were a bit challenging. It's a fantastic piece of 1980s computer weirdness, and yeah man, I'm just really glad that it still exists, frankly. I was even able to hook the Nintendo up again and play two games at the same time on this computer, which was pretty funny. But anyway guys, that's pretty much going to be it for this video. It ended up being way longer than I really wanted it to be, but that's how it goes sometimes, unfortunately. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And I hope you tune in again next time for more interesting things that we're going to be doing with this IBM 5155. Until then, cheers guys.